All right, a very good afternoon to you and you're welcome to News Beat here on Metro TV with me, Annie Afonpofo. We're live from the APR Bahama studio at North Ridge. You follow us on social media, it's Metro TV Ghana. And of course, also on channel 277 DSTV. On Instagram and Twitter, it's Metro TV underscore GH. My name is Annie Afonpofo. Let's take a look at the stories or the, head the headlines of the stories coming up. Former CEO of the Public Procurement Authority, Ajenim Boateng, Ajay, says that he obtained court order to defreeze his bank accounts before he withdrew monies in them. Meanwhile, the Association of Magistrates and Judges of Ghana, AMG, A, AMGJ, has the bank claims that they are being paid extra gratia every four years. We're here from the president of the association. And on the foreign front, French President Emmanuel Macron has rejected uh, a resignation offer from the prime minister he appointed, saying instead of that, uh, he will take a different decision and government must stay on task and act. We'll give you details of that as well. You're welcome back. Let's do our first story. And the former chief executive officer of the Public Procurement Authority, Ajenim Boateng, Ajay, said he got a court order to defreeze his bank account before he withdrew the monies in them. Now, he was said to have successfully cleared all his uh, various bank accounts which were declared by the special prosecutor in 2019, a statement issued by his lawyers of the former uh, uh, chief executive or procurement officer stated. Let's get the slides of this um, statement. And the slide says, as we wish to inform the general public that our client was granted access to his bank accounts pursuant to an order to defreeze accounts dated August 19, 2021, by the High Court in uh, suit numbered, and the suit number is there, is MSFT 078-2019, and titled, The Special Prosecutor versus a genuine boating a J, and not in connivance with bank officials as published, we're reliably informed all his accounts are still active. Uh, the next one says that we're further informed that in the publication sought to create an erroneous impression that our client had millions of CDs in his personal account when the facts clearly show that the figures being circulated around is only a total turnover of inflows with corresponding outflows. Now, for instance, an official 100,000 CDs deposit can be turned over into millions over a period of time by just withdrawals and redepositing of same. The said publication was thought to suggest that our client had millions of CDs sitting in his account and had gone to withdraw same dubiously is probably false and uh, tantamount to making our clients vulnerable to attacks that could risk his life. Our client is always conducted his affairs within the um, ambit of the laws of Ghana and has consistently been guided by the statutes and principles uh, in the discharge of his duties during this tenure, during his tenure in office. There is more, but uh, I think we will end it here.
Now let's do some more stories and, and some four first -time members of parliament over the new patriotic party uh, are alleged to have received double salaries. So they have been accused of failing to refund the overpaid salaries to state coffers months after the notification by the Controller and Accountant General. Now, the MPs in question are Sylvester uh, Tete of uh, Botiano English Amanfo, and also who allegedly took about 131,000 Ghana cities for Pru, uh, MP for Pru West as well, Stephen Jalula, who has also been reported to have taken 119,000 cities. An MP for Kintampo, Alexander Jan, allegedly received an amount of 119,000 Ghana cities. Now, the MP for Salaga North, Al Hassan Edi, was uh, reported to have taken 42,000 cities. Joining us by Zoom is Stephen Jalula, who is currently uh, Deputy Minister for Roads uh, and Highways, uh, who has also been cited in. Uh, this report. Stephen, thank you, Honorable Member. Thank you for your time. You're welcome to Newsbeats and good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me on your program. Right. So we've been having some conversations with some of these MPs that have been mentioned uh, in this issue. You're one of them. Some of them have denied that they haven't received a double salary. Some have also indicated that they have actually repaid into the National Kitty. What is your story uh, against this story that's already been reported? All right. Most grateful for this. Um, when we came into Parliament on 7th of January 2021, mm -hmm. the Controller and Accountant General's Department should have stopped all our emoluments from coming into our bank accounts. But unfortunately, unfor that didn't happen. Uh, what we realized is that... Um, the MMDC's uh, salaries were stopped for some time. And when they started paying them, then they paid us some arrears. Then we contacted them to say that, hey, you are paying some monies into our accounts and we need it to stop because we don't want this issue to become a topical issue later on. And it was until uh, August of 2021 that they managed to stop it. And then the refund was done immediately afterwards. And I personally refunded my on the 1st of, 1st of October, 2021. And um, we are still yet to get official um, letter or correspondence from the controller that they have uh, cleared us. But we have cited a memo that was dated around 28th of January, 2022 uh, by from the chief accountant to the head of EPD, indicating that uh, they had cleared me. And it is not me alone. All the MMDCs who transited from the, the, being DCE to MPs. And uh, yes, so that's what happened. So we all did this as a group. And I'm surprised that whoever did this research or whatever brought this up, could they even contact the controller and accountant uh, general department to get their side of the story or even contacted some of us uh, that we could have provided them with documents to buttress what i'm just saying but i want uh, everybody to know Ghanaians, to know that we are very honorable people and we do not seek to gain or to to take any on end salary and that is why we took steps without anybody asking us to do so just to be sure that uh, the money that were paid into our accounts returned back to the government chest. So in your case, you have refunded 100 and... Uh, uh, now, what, what's your amount? Okay, your amount is 119,000 cities. Yes. And it's been refunded in full. In full. Uh, so uh, can the, you know, the, the state coffers also confirm that and how so that we are all on the it's same a, page? It's up to you to go find out whether what I'm stating here uh, are factual. Right. Whether I paid back in October, be even before Accountant General Department even wrote to me. This is a mark of a good citizen for him to even know that this is not good. And he does that even before. I think it was even our payment that prompted them to even write a letter they wrote in December. Well, after two months, 75 days. 
Uh, honorable, hold on. Let me speak with uh, anti graft campaigner Vitus Azim, who has also joined us uh, uh, for a further interrogation of this matter. Um, uh, Mr. Vitus Azim, thank you for your time. You're welcome to Newsbeat. So, uh, is it the fault of the members of parliament that this has happened? Well, I don't think it's their fault. But then, for example, these days with the computerization, you will get reports from your banks when transactions take place. So if any monies were paid into their account without their knowledge, and it will have come to their attention through their banks. And so for those, for anybody, I mean, I, so it's, it's proper that if they, if they were paid or paid twice, they just take steps to refund the, the extra payment and to inform the, the, pay, the person who paid the money to stop such a practice. How faulty is, is our payroll management system where we even have one of the members uh, who was also mentioned, Sylvester Tete, saying that he never received double salaries or any over amount. So he is not even, uh, or he shouldn't be included in the members of parliament who are said to have received more amounts in their accounts. Uh, so he's, you know, going around trying to clear his name. What, what is the fault with our payroll system? Well, the payroll system, the fault with the payroll system is that we, some of the people that we take to work on the computers and all that are probably not uh, really qualified people that should handle these things, or that our systems are not the best. Because some of these things, if the payment is from one authority, the name pops up, uh, it will not know the standard of It doesn't seem like Vitas Azim's, uh, you know, reception is too can good. You can, can you hear me, please? Hello, Vitas Azim. Okay, I, I cannot get him, but let me go back to Stephen Jalila, who is also Deputy Minister. Oh, no, but what would be your last word before we let you go? I mean, if you say you have refunded, it's up to us really to, to check. But what would be your last words on this issue? Oh, uh, really, I would just want the um, Ghanaian people to know that uh, this is unlike the, maybe the previous one where somebody um, saw payments into their accounts and they kept quiet. We saw payments into our accounts and we, take, we took initiatives to, to return the monies to wherever they came from. And that is what I want uh, the Ghanaian people to know. And we did this well over two months before the accountant general even noticed that they were doing something wrong. Thank so, you. So, I mean, coming from the uh, guest house, maybe you may want to comment on that. There is obviously a problem with our payroll uh, management system. What are we going to do? Because we cannot have uh, our payroll system overpaying uh, public servants that they are not supposed to be paid the way they do. Yes, uh, if you ask me, I think um, the legislature and the executive need to collaborate more when it comes to emoluments and how it is paid, especially people shifting from one arm to the other. And I, otherwise this uh, issue will keep recurring every year or every four years, because uh, we have people from executive, former CEOs, former district chief executives, former municipal chief executives transiting into, uh, into, into parliament. If it is not worked, I'm sure that uh, next year, two years from, from now, 2025, these things will be repeated again. Honorable uh, Stephen Jalula, thank you for your time. I uh, will speak to you another, another time uh, as we confirm the payments that have been refunded into the state coffers. You're still watching Newsbeat here on Metro TV. Let's do some more stories. In the Association of the Magistrates and Judges of the Ghana, AMGJG, has debunked claims that they, ha they are being paid extra share every four years. Now, according to its president, Justice Henry Kofi, the salaries of the courts, the superior court judges, are determined after every four years and changes to the effects that determined by the president uh, of the Republic of uh, upon recommendations. So that is what it, these judges are saying, but there's a story to it. We have had to, as an association, issue this press statement 
on behalf of the Magistrate and Judges Association on a recent allegation that Superior Court judges, that is Supreme Court judges, Court of Appeal judges, and High Court judges receive ex gratia payment every four years. There have been a lot of questions thrown at us which we have refused to answer. But we have thought it necessary to issue this statement to clarify the position of Superior Court judges with regard to the remuneration system, specifically with the S. Gratia. The Association of Magistrates and Judges of Ghana has followed the discussion on the payment of S. Gratia to some Article 71 office holders and has noted with dismay the false and malicious allegations that judges of the Superior Court, that is the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeal, and High Court judges are paid as gratia at the end of every four, four years. The Association of Magistrates and Judges of Ghana would like to state without any equivocation whatsoever that that allegation with regard to the payment of S. Gratia to judges and magistrates of the Superior Court every four years is false and baseless. The salaries of Superior Court judges, that is to say Supreme Court judges, including the Chief Justice, Court of Appeal judges, and High Court judges are determined once every four years by His Excellency the President on the recommendation of a committee appointed by His Excellency under Article 71.1 of the Constitution 1992. Two, that if increases are effected in the salary as a result of the recommendations of the committee, the judges are then paid arrears of salary, commonly called back pay arising from backdating of the salary increase, which is normal. That is what usually happens in all institutions. If your salary increase is delayed for one year, two years, three years, you are entitled to be paid your salary arrears, and that's what we receive. This arrears of salary or back pay are accordingly paid after the determination in a lump sum or installment. This has been the situation since 1996 with the setting up of various committees by the various presidents to determine the salary of Attic 71 office holders. The Member of Parliament for Ashaman, Enes Nogbe, says he is dragging government to court over his decision to engage David Ajay as a sole consultant for the construction of the National National Cathedral. Now, according to the MP, the decision to engage David Ajaye under a sole sourcing contract for a project of this nature is in clear breach of the procurement laws. A single source contract to David Ajaye on the cathedral issue, and, uh, which is against the rules of law, uh, especially against the Public Procurement Act. Uh, the office of the president, which is the entity in this matter, asked for single source procurement under 725A, uh, which is to say that uh, David Ajay is the sole consultant in the whole world. And uh, for that matter, the contract must be awarded to him. And uh, the, 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 the public procurement authority have now uh, gone beyond 725, uh, 725A to award the contract rather under 75, uh, 725B, which means that it is under emergency. And so you see the lacuna there. And so I'm heading to court for the court to set aside this single source, uh, I mean, procurement under uh, consultancy, and also David Ajay, whichever money that was paid to him, he has to refund that money back because it is, it is not within the laws of Ghana especially the public procurement. How soon are you going to court? Oh, very soon. By the close of the week, uh, I should be filing because my, my, my lawyers are working on it. Okay. Are you saying that the cathedral project is an emergency? Not specifically the project itself, 
but the consultancy. I mean, that is what I'm talking about, the consultancy. You cannot, for, under single source procurement, you can do that under competitive tendering, but you cannot do that under single source procurement. Single source procurement condition, the preconditions are one, either it is under emergency or catastrophe, or I mean, any other relevant, maybe national security or whatever it is. But under this circumstance, we are not under any of those conditions. And so you cannot award the contract for consultancy under any, of, under any of these conditions. And that is all the more reason why I'm going. And don't also forget that the, the office of the president required the, the PPA for the single source procurement under 725A, but rather uh, 725B was granted, which both of them are against the rule of law. But the argument is that he has a capacity. It, it is not necessarily about the capacity. It is about following due process. It is about what the law says. He can never be the sole or the single uh, I mean, uh, consultant in this world and uh, architectural consultant. We have a lot, many of such uh, personalities are in this, even in this country, let alone the whole world. And for you to say that he should be given the contract under single source procurement, it is never done. Despite the fact that he may have the capacity, the capability, etc., somebody may also have a similar capacity and capabilities. And so it must go through competitive tendering. And when you look at the, the percentage that was given to him, I think it's over 10% that was given to him. And you cannot do that. It is, it is against the law. Oh, definitely, if, if, if some uh, money has been lost, an amount of money, the 10% of the contract has been lost already because it was awarded that contract under single source procurement and money was advanced to him already. And so uh, we, we, can, we cannot, uh, 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 I mean, uh, underestimate this particular, uh, uh, I mean, endeavor. And so money... Can We'll still stay a little longer in Parliament, and the Speaker of Parliament has threatened to drag uh, the Transport Minister to the Privileges Committee over the latter's failure to show up in Parliament to answer some nine questions on the floor of the House. Remember that we've had a history of also the Finance Minister who was required to appear before the House and answer some questions on the economy, and I think time uh, and number he has postponed or failed to show up, and always it's been in the last minutes that the finance minister will give the notification. But it looks like the transport minister finds himself in the same soup. Let's have what the, uh, the Speaker of Parliament is saying about this. Uh, it's informed. A date is scheduled, and the minister is to appear before the House to answer the question. And the standing orders are very clear on that. It's mandatory for the minister to appear to answer the question. Now, from what I've been given, the minister, through the acting chief director, one Mrs. Mabel Segu, submitted a letter dated 20th of June. That's just yesterday. And it was received at 10.30 a.m. today, 21st of June, at the table office by the clerk at table and then process through to the leadership. I have just been given a copy of that letter. Honorable members, I agree with leadership that this is not good enough. Was the minister has been given sufficient notice to appear today to answer the question? And the speaker, uh, the, the minister has used his acting chief director to inform the House that he will not be available today to answer the questions. He prefers that the questions be rescheduled to Thursday, 23rd June. Honorable members, speakers don't dis uh, ministers don't decide when they will appear to the House to answer the questions. That decision is not for ministers. That decision 
is for the House and the Speaker. And so, by the constitutional provision, if you all read Article 1 to 2, this constitutes contempt of the House. You see, an act, I'm reading Article 1 to 2, an act or omission who obstructs or impedes Parliament in the performance of its function, or which obstructs or impedes a member or officer of Parliament in the discharge of his duties, or affronts the dignity of Parliament, or which tends either directly or indirectly to produce that result, is contempt of Parliament. This provision has been captured in outstanding orders as Order 28. I agree with the submission made by the leaders that this is one of the ministers who used to be very punctual in responding to questions asked by members. But of late, his conduct seemed to be negating all the gains he made in the House. I am tempted to refer his conduct to the Privileges Committee. But because of the intervention of leadership, I will resist that temptation and not refer him to the Privileges Committee for today. But the next conduct tantamount to this behavior will be referred to the Privileges Committee. Speaker of Parliament, Sumana, Avan Sumana Babing. Now, uh, nine persons have been sworn in as board of members of the Office of the Special Prosecutor. This move makes the Office of the Special Prosecutor fully operational to effectively carry out its mandate. My colleague Elvis Andor is on the beat and joins us live with updates. Hello, Elvis. You're welcome. Good afternoon. Security. And of course, the Special Prosecutor and the Deputy Special Prosecutor themselves. You all bring onto this board rich and valuable experience garnered over long periods of service in your respective fields of service to the nation. I am in no doubt that you will deploy this to the attainment to the objects of the office and ultimately justify the trust of the nation conveyed by your appointment by the President of the Republic, and now Dan Kweku Fado. I congratulate you on your appointment. It will be neglectful not to know that the Sphere Prosecutor himself is a man with immense experience in criminal law. As I've said before, it's my belief that with the right attitude, mindset, and understanding of the demands of public service, Mr. Kisei Jabin will live up to the duties imposed on him by the law establishing the office. Board members, you hold office for a three-year period in accordance with the tenets of institutional independence that you enjoy. You are required to elect one of your own to be chairperson. The mandate of your board is well defined in at 959. The board is, in addition to its general responsibility for formulating policies necessary for the achievement of the objects of the office, particularly required to ensure the proper and effective performance of the, of, of the functions of the office. Advise the special prosecutor on the recruitment and selection of senior staff of the office and facilitate co cooperation between the office and relevant national investigative bodies. I entreat you to be mindful of the duties and liabilities of a member of the board under Section 7 of Act 959. A violation of this provision will result in cessation of your membership on the board. May I also remind you of your very important obligation to declare your assets in accordance with Article 286 of the Constitution, as well as the disclosure of interest obligations under Section 10 of Act 959. Mm -hmm. Whenever a member of the board has an interest in any matter coming up for consideration, faithful adherence to these simple duties, whose far-reaching implications for your record in public life. It is imperative to state that in order to hold a public special prosecutor accountable, as all public officers in the country are, at 959 requires you to keep books of accounts and records in the form approved by the Auditor General, on basis of which the Auditor General will audit the accounts of the office at the end of every financial year. Right, you're still watching news beat. We'll take a breather. When we come back, we'll give you some more stories.
You're welcome back to Newsbeat on Metro TV. Now, two flights are scheduled to airlift 866 pilgrims from the Tamale International Airport today to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to partake in the, this year's Hajj. Now, this is a second barge after the first barge of 433 uh, was lifted on Monday from Tamale. The Hajj board was permitted by the Saudi Authority to register 3,069 pilgrims of which 1,732 will fly from Tamale, while the rest of the numbers uh, will take off in Kotoko International Airport in Accra. Yes, that's about 65. Your visa cannot be in the process. So those that you see that appear to be aged, appear older than 65. Well, your guests as far as good as mine, in terms of whether they are older than 65 or not. But as far as we are concerned, their passports indicate that they are not above 65. The first time we have the Hajj terminal in Ghana, and in Tamale to be precise, we have, this is about the first of its kind in the whole of West Africa. And we thank God that we have a government that cares for the people of Ghana, and we have this one situated here. Our Philippines are elated, they are most grateful to them, and we thank them, and we are also assuring them the people that they are. Meanwhile, Deputy Communications Director of the Hajj Board, Hajia Mariama Sisi, has dismissed claims by a protesting group accusing the board of charging extra fees for this year's pilgrimage. Speaking to Metro News, Hajia Mariam uh, explained that the depreciation of the city is a major cause of the hikes in prices per person. Organized today, he called the organization Patriotic Muslim Front. Is that the true representative or the true representation of Muslims in Ghana? Did you see that in that uh, demonstration? All we saw is contracted or a group of Kaya's uh, assistants from the north organized to you know, back him up to come and do what he did. First of all, if you are saying that programs paid monies to the Hajj board, as at 2020, they paid 19500 then the exchange rate was four cities, 30 pesos, 4.3. As we speak, the exchange rate is eight point something. My sister, do the calculations yourself. We know what is happening. We know the economic situation all over, not just Ghana. Apart from that, what the Hajj board did because these programs, well, those who chose to leave their, their monies with the hard board, even though that opportunity was given, whoever doesn't want to leave his money can come for it. Some did, of course. And those who left their monies with a hard board, their condition given is that they pay an addition of 7000 making their hard fare 26500 just because of the fact that they left their money since 2000 with the hard board. And of course, if you have your monies in the bank, of course it is going to accrue some interest. Looking at how much this year's programs are paying, they are paying 39,000. Let's do the arithmetic here. A difference of 13,000 Ghana cities, meaning 130 million. Are you saying that we haven't been fair to this program? Let's now get onto the phone lines and speak with Harina Mohammed, who is president of the Patriotic Movement Front, organizers of the protest on Monday. Uh, Harina, thank you for your time. Um, good afternoon to you. Welcome to Newsbeat. Uh, before you hit the street to protest, did you speak with the executives of the Hajj board? Thank you for having me this afternoon. Um, indeed, I listened to your news in brief. And I also followed yesterday what uh, my good sister spoke about. Indeed, as you, your question, yes, we wrote to the board for an explanation with regards to the fees they charge this year. Before then, let me address this uh, concern that I've raised. You know, my good sister sought to say that we, the Patriotic Muslim Front, did not represent the true Muslims in this country. To the effect that 
those people who came out in their numbers to demonstrate against the unwarranted increase to 39,000 Ghana cities were not, the Muslims were not representative. Mm -hmm. is, is that what you want to say? That because you are Kaya Ye, you are not a Muslim? Is that what you sought to say? And the question I want to ask, is there a tag on... Uh, Haruna, kindly, kindly raise your, vo your voice a bit and, and position yourself properly. All right. Um, I was saying that my good sister made mention of a contracted Kaya Ye's to say that they were not the true representation of the Muslim Ummah. And I'm asking whether if you are a Kaya Ye, you are not a Muslim. That's the question I want to ask. And again, is there a tag on those people who poured out to demonstrate for the insensitivity of the board that they are not Muslims, Ummah? Is that what she sought to say? Again, I listened to her made mention that I was once with the previous board in um, SY administration, which is a part of life. I want to make this known to everyone that I have never been appointed by any government to serve under any of them. I've never served under any board before, and I stand to correct my good sister. We were both together doing business there in the previous administration. She can recall when she was given contract to print uh, flyers for the board, I was there also to do business with them as well. So she should not misconstrue our representation to mean that um, we are there for mischief. No. I see. Again, so um, I'm coming. Look at what she said, that if you paid your money and left it with the board for two years, they are rather doing you a favor by making you pay additional 7000 as compared to those who are yet to pay 39,000. They are doing you a favor. That is what we say an insensitivity to the highest with impunity. What do you mean by telling me, signing a contract with me in paragraph three, stating it clearly that in the event where there will be increment, you'll be exempted. What does it stand for? And you then come back to tell me that because of the exchange rates, you didn't foresee this coming? Would you do that if that board was your personal property? That's so, the first thing we are asking. Well, so speaking with her, she actually didn't sound like the board was even showing so much interest. The posture uh, didn't show that it was showing so much interest in the concerns that you have raised. Uh, she's mentioned the factors of the exchange rates as well. What are you going to do going forward? That's what I'm saying there. If you are a manager of a company, would you sign such an agreement? knowing that you cannot have the control of the exchange rate. Didn't she project that in the near, near term in future, this could happen? We never foresaw COVID coming, but it, ca it came. What did we do? And so as me, a pilgrim, what is my crime for admitting or accepting on condition that leave your money with me, I would not be affected should there be any increment. And so this kind of um, divisive kind of comment that um, those people are Kayas, they are not the true Muslims. It is neither here nor there. She should address the concerns of the Muslim Ummah. The 39,000 Ghana cities, we wrote to them, telling them to give us an item by item breakdown so that we could appreciate with them. And then we raised a concern about Sheikh Aisikwe um, and what he, he went to do in Saudi Arabia, sought to change the signatories to the account, having an absolute you know, access to their account without the board knowing. It is an act of criminality. And those are our concerns. It is not about Kaya people pouring on the streets. I never contracted anybody. Right. right. Haruna, for the sake of time, we'll leave it here. Haruna Mohammed is the president of the Patriotic Movement uh, Front, and uh, they are contesting the figures and the uh, monies they're paying for the Hajj pilgrimage. We'll follow through and see how far they go. I'm sure Winston Taki is a Christian, so he will be going to Israel. Winston, you're welcome. Thank you, Annie. <laughs> Definitely us into the we'll be going to Israel world. next year. It's time to bring your business right after this. And now to a false business story. Project coordinator for government unemployment insurance schemes, Dr. Kwabena Nyako Otu says there will be no stipends for individuals who will be enrolled onto the training and retraining program under the scheme as being reported.
by some media houses. So you should make a distinction between the National Unemployment Insurance Scheme and the training and retraining program, which was launched yesterday. So for the training and retraining, it is fully funded by government. Uh, those that will benefit don't have to pay for the fees or the training. It was initially conceived, but given the budgetary constraints, there will be no stipend. What government would do is to essentially pay for your fees so that you avail yourself of the training. And then the training is supposed to have an entrepreneurial component that allows people to move on on their own. But we also recognize that as of now, some of the beneficiaries could be working uh, either part-time or full-time. But we want to help upgrade their skills. So it's not like we are training you for government to offer you employment. You should, you should know the characteristics of um, uh, teachers and educational workers in the private school. What we know today is that most of them are untrained teachers. Uh, they are not like the public school where people have gone through the teacher training college. In fact, they are graduate teaching, but they are untrained teachers. So the idea is to help them actually get certificated, to go through uh, a training program that offers them the skill and the, uh, the education and the methodologies for teaching. An investment analyst with Africa Investment Group, Dr. Akwesi Ampofo, has argued that the Bank of Ghana should have raised its benchmark monetary policy rate higher than it has done. According to him, this would have helped attract foreign investors into the economy. The Bank of Ghana in May raised the MPC rate by 200 basis points to 19%. He was speaking on bottom line. They haven't gotten it yet because they haven't increased the rate enough. That's what they are doing in the U.S. They start with, okay, let's go up with 100 basis points. Mm -hmm. Let's go up with 150 basis points mm -hmm. and see. Mm -hmm. So if it's failing, they will keep increasing mm -hmm. the rate over time until mm -hmm. it begins to take effect. Mm -hmm. For example, if somebody were to tell you today that if you buy government bonds, we are going to give you 45% mm -hmm. interest rate. Yes. Most people will take well, it well, on, obviously, right? Obviously, obviously uh, get into uh, it. Exactly. And, and that's what they are trying to do. They are on the right path, but they have not increased it enough to gain traction. Mm. So what they are supposed to do is not just the policy rate, but also they also need to look at prices of fuel, what percent, what component of the price is made up of government taxes, can they do something about it? Uh, yes, you will feel it. They will not feel it as much. But let's ask ourselves the question, who gave them that power? The and people. Who, and who has the right to take it the away? The people. The people. It all comes back to the people. Don't look at your stomach the time you are voting. You could, you could talk to somebody who you're going to vote for, but when you get in there, it's between you and your conscience. Vote for whoever you believe is going to do the right thing by you. Now, the city declined by 0.43% against the U.S. dollar and by 1.17% against the British pound on the forex market, whilst in commodities, crude prices went up and is trading at $133 on the world market. Up next, forex in commodities market. For business here on Newsbeat, my name is Winston Taki. We're back with sports with Phil Dunkote after this break. Let's focus on Ghanaian top athlete Benjamin Azamati, who will secure victory in the Paris Diamond League and has expressed excitement after winning. Um, um, I like the athlete I'm going into. I mean, uh, Oslo obviously taught me a lot of lessons. So coming into this meet, you know, I had a couple of notes down to, you know, go through through my race. Um, I needed to stay relaxed as possible, you know, just go through the heat and um, you could see from my start that I almost stumbled but I remained patient and I was able to go through the race to relax and I was able to win gold. Um, I mean, um, um, 
I psyched myself up that uh, whatever the, the conditions may be, whatever the whatever that goes on around me, I'm still going to stay relaxed, and I was able to do that throughout the race. Ghanaian artist Benjamin Zamati speaking in the French capital of Paris after winning the Diamond League over there. That's your spot. Desi is standing by for the latest in showbiz. Hello, Phil. Up next, we do entertainment news. My name is Desmond Okrekudan, so let's begin from Kumasi, where members of the Ashanti Regional Branch of the Musicians Union of Ghana Musica have staged a demonstration against the executives. According to them, the union lacks leadership, which is affecting the industry, and are calling for re-election of the executive. Let's speak to the leader of uh, the demonstrators, Joseph Mesa, who is a gospel musician, and uh, we have him on phone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here on Newsbeat. Really, what is your issue with, you know, your mother, you know, that is a music guy? Yeah, uh, good afternoon to your listeners. Um, our problem is uh, from 2018 and um, Mr. Baizo Kufo ended with his office and uh, we need to, we need an, another elections and we wait now. Uh, there no, there is no uh, any organize, uh, they are not organizing the uh, election for us to vote. Mm. Election committee, we are still waiting for them Same for three years now. We don't know why why they are, they are doing that. And we, the members of Ashanti region, uh, uh, are making that um, demonstration against okay. them. Have you reached down to the executive to let them know that this is what you want them to do? Yeah, they know. They know they are right. They know. They know that the election committee they have to they have to uh, arrange the date. They have to give us a date and so that we can vote to elect our president. They know. Mm. And after this, if nothing is done, what would be the next line of action? Uh, the next line is uh, we are going to the office of the president because the, the the office of the president sit them down and and give them uh, uh, um, um, uh, privilege to. Um, to, 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 for, for the election. Okay. But now, but up till now, we are not doing anything. So uh, after this, when we didn't hear anything from them, we go to press that again. Okay, Joseph, thank you so much for talking to us. We'll get back to you for more on that. So Joseph Mesa is the leader of the demonstrators in the Ashanti region, um, as they want uh, fresh, you know, elections for the executives in the region and also at the national level. Let's move on to some other stories. And uh, GH TikTokers, have uh, stated that without them, no song will be able to blow. And uh, we'll be speaking to Ricky Tenney. See, he is a music executive and the head of programming and music services at Three Music um, Network. For more on this, if really what they're saying is the right thing that without them, irrespective of how relevant you are, your song can never uh, you know, blow out there on social media. And Ricky, thank you for joining us here on Newsbeat. What do you make of the accession by the TikTokers? Um, well, good afternoon, and thank you for having me. Um, interestingly, well, it, it, it's their platform, you understand? It's, it's their mode of work. So definitely they are going to um, find ways to get people to value their platform. So for that, I respect them for that. But, you know, we can also not take away the fact that um, TikTok now has become a very, very, very essential platform you know, for music marketing. So, yes, they are right when they say, I saw it, I, I, look, at, I, I look at it like um, they were just playing about it. I know people are taking it too serious, but I feel mm. they were just playing about it, you know, but realistically, it's, it's true. It's very important that people take um, the TikTok marketing, you know, platform very, very, very um, serious because, you know, songs have risen from TikTok even songs that have um, actually died down for decades. TikTok has found a way to bring those songs back, those songs back. Record labels have actually reached out or used that same platforms, you know, to get songs back, you know, on track because they own their masters, they own their catalogs, and they want a certain level of attention, or a certain level of um, um, value for that song. Okay. They use TikTok, yes, to get generate that interest. Again, um, you cannot really discount the fact that 
there are other tools beyond TikTok. And that's that's where the danger is. I think they shouldn't get too comfortable, you know, because TikTok, mind you, TikTok is not the only platform or the only music marketing, you know, platform or strategy. So if you think, um, because I'm a, I'm a TikTok influencer, nobody else can blow without, you know, my channel, it is wrong. So for me, I think, yes, I, I saw it as J, they just, you know, um, getting excited about um, their position now. But then again, they, they, they shouldn't get too comfortable. They should be very, very, very focused about the fact that if they really understand the music business properly, they will know clearly that the fact that I give a song to a TikTok influencer does not guarantee me a hit song. And they, they can clearly testify that there's been several people who have reached out to them to promote their songs and it hasn't become a hit. And that is the question we should be posing to them that, okay, if we are really supposed to take your words seriously, or we are, we are really supposed to hold you by your words, can you tell us how many songs as TikTok influencers you've made hits? Okay. And now they will be able to prove us or prove to us if really they are the, uh, you know, the backbone of hit songs in Ghana or not. So okay. it's, 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 it, it depends on the way you want to, you know, look at it. Look at it. All right. Th thank you very much, Ricky Tennyson, for speaking to us. He is uh, the head of programming and music services at Three Music Networks. And that's it for entertainment. My name is Desmond Okrekudan. So I need standing by.